Okay, so in this video, I want to go through this buy and hold equities uh, strategy uh, bootcamp in QuantConnect. It's the first one that you should do. In my opinion, it's the simplest, simplest one. Um, it just goes through the very basics of, of buying, starting your algorithms and then buying in, in, uh, a stock. And uh, I thought still that it was a bit confusing uh, in the beginning when I started out. So I want to go through step by step and giving you a bit more details. And then at the end, I'm also going to give you a little trick to even though it's really simple what we're doing, how you could actually beat, uh, beat the market with like a little uh, extra thing that you could add to your strategy. So let's get started. Um, we are gonna, instead of going through the lessons here, I'm going to build it out in a real project so we can run some back tests. I think that's quite annoying in the bootcamp that you cannot actually run your what the code you are writing. So let's go and create an algorithm. And here you just say exit builder mode. Okay. And then you, just ha you will have this template here that you can work, work with or you can delete it. but. It's easier to just keep it because you're gonna need all this stuff anyways. So the first thing we want to do is to have our starting cash um, uh, coded and it's already put in here by default. So you don't really have to do anything. You just have to understand what's going on. This call here or this line of code says that it tells the algorithm what our initial capital, our initial cash position is in our brokerage account. So right now we are telling our algorithm that we have a hundred thousand dollars. By default, said cash is in dollars. So it tells the algorithm that we have a hundred thousand dollars to um, trade with. So we don't need to do anything else than that. Then we need to have a date range and you can see already here we have this initial uh, set start date and um, this is the date that we want our backtest to start from so we could change it to start from 2017 for example and uh, the first of january so it goes like month and date um, you could also add uh, hours and minutes if you wanted to. Uh, it's like a daytime object, the inputs here, I'm pretty sure. But normally you would never do that, um, just in very specific circumstances. You can also put in an end date if you want to run your algorithms all the way uh, just to a specific date. So then you would say set end date. And you have to make it bigger than the start date, of course. So we could say, let's run this argument for a year. You don't need an end date. Uh, if you don't have this line of code, it will just run until uh, the current date, uh, minus a few days. Whatever Quant Connect has of data, which is normally like uh, your current date minus a day or two. So. Let's just do that now. Let's just run until the current date. So we'll just keep this one line here and skip this one. It's good having the end date here as well if you're doing like recurrent tests and you wanna compare two different algorithms or like two different iterations of an algorithm. So if I'm testing out, if I'm making changes to an algorithm, algorithm that's already working, then if I'm working on it today and running it from 2017 until today, um, I'm going to look at a specific ROI. I'm going to make a certain amount of money or lose a certain amount of money. Then if I work on it a week from now again and run it again, that number is going to change because now I have data from a few more days. So in that case, it would be helpful to have an end date, right? So I don't get that extra few days of, of uh, running time. Um, uh, so the algorithm algo is more consistent. Okay, so for now, let's just leave it. Then what we need to do is we should add some data. We should add some kind of equities. And you can see it's already actually done here for us in this template version. Um, so we can just 
uh, comment this, uh, remove the comment. And then what this line does is it subscribes to a specific uh, equity, in this case, the SPY. Um, and then we have to put in a resolution as well. Actually, we don't have to put in a resolution. By default, it is minute data. So we could just put this in. That would be the same as um, this. Oh, I messed that up. It would be the same as uh, this. But in this resolution minute, what does that mean? It means that for each minute where the algorithm has data, so like in the in the in the trading um, uh, in the open open trading hours, for each minute in those hours, um, there will be some data that's then put into our on data in here. Let me try and say that a bit more. Uh, easy to understand. So for example, we have the SPY here with the resolution of one minute. And this is a trading view, a super nice thing to be able to look at uh, data um, and graphs. So for example, here you can see on the 29th of January when the market opens, this is here 9.30. Uh, this is a minute bar. So here we have um, how the price action uh, took place during this one minute. So we have an open and high and low and close. And that creates this bar here. Then what we're doing is by doing this, we are saying we want the SPY bar of one minute to be put into our on data. So all of these bars here, every minute will get a bar of data that's then put into our algorithm here on, on data. And then we can work on that to create some kind of uh, strategy of buying and selling and so on. So if we change this resolution to hour, for example, then our data would be an hour. So then our resolution would be an hour long, right? So like a day, for example, here would consist of um, uh, starting time of 10 a.m., 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, so those those bars would then be entered here on, on data. We could also do daily, and we can also do seconds, and we can also do ticks, which is the smallest time format that's available. Um, for now, let's stick with minutes. Uh, actually, let's stick with hours just to make the algorithm run a bit faster. So furthermore, in this add equity here, there's a few more parameters that you can add if you want to. Um, I think it's pretty useful to, uh, to put in all of them normally, even though they're just default, just to know what's going on. So the next thing you have to, you can add is a string, which is, um, which market that you want this equity to be from. And that is by default, the US market. So you don't have to add that, but you can. And if it's not the US market, of course you have to. Then there will be a Boolean, which is a fill data forward and if you put that to true, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if you put that to true, then it means that if for some reason the data is not available in the, in the system, then we will take the previous data that we had and just forward that to the, to, to the current time. So let's say that like now it's 10 a.m., 10 a.m., and on data gets the data from 10 a.m. But it's not available. It's not a number or something like that. Then it will go back and take the data from 9.59, like a minute ago, and just use that instead if we put this to true. If we put it to false, uh, we'll just get 
um, the no data. Then the next thing you can do is to have leverage. And this is a, a number. So if you have, um, let's say you have 2x leverage uh, in your trading account. So you can buy, if you have 100,000 cash, you can buy for 200,000. Then you can put a two here, um, which I also think is default, or maybe it's just one, not sure, but this is a leverage, or you can also put it as a decimal 1.5, for example. Let's keep that for two for now. We have two leverage. And then the last thing you can put in is extended market hours, which is also a Boolean. So that means if you put true here, then you will get data down here from extended market hours so that means pre-market hours and after market hours um, and if it's false here you'll just get data from the normal trading hours from 9 30 to uh, 16 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the afternoon 4 p.m so let's just keep that for false for now and let's then move on to the next thing we had to do which was talk about the data normalization mode which is in quant connect the data that you get by default is adjusted so that means that it takes into account share splits and dividend payments and that means that for example if you look at uh, apple they recently had um, a stock split a five to one so their stock price was like 500 or something or 300 or something back like half a year ago but now because it's split five to one it might be like a hundred or something right so that is confusing when you're running your algorithm um, and can create errors if you don't take that into account but by default it's taking into account by um, Quant connect, so you don't have to worry about it. But if you do, for some reason, have to worry about it, then you can change the default uh, adjusted, uh, split adjusted, and dividend adjustment. You can change it by saying, for example, here, we can save this as SPY. So this will return a symbol, uh, symbol class that will then save in the in our uh, SPY uh, par parameter here and then we can we can call set data no, uh, normalization mode and we can say data normalization mode um, adjusted and this is what is default. So you don't have to write this, but if you wanted to not have it adjusted, then you could say raw. Um, this is normally not something you have to worry about and work with. Um, I don't think it's very common to use this, but if you have a strategy that takes that into account, of course you have to use it. Um, but normally you wouldn't have to worry about this. So let's just keep this as adjusted by for now. And remember, this is the default, so you don't have to write this line if you just wanted the adjusted one. Then let's go on to placing orders. So down here in on data, remember this is the place that will run for each time we have a new bar of data. So in this case, we have it every hour. That's what we put in. So every hour we'll get in the open hours, trading hours, and we'll get new data into whatever you write in this function right here, in this method right here. So uh, you can see we already have this default here and we could, um, we can reuse that. But for now, the bootcamp talks about the market order. So let me just show you that. So this is how you create a market order. And if you don't know what all the different orders are, you should, uh, you should read up on those. There's like a lot of different ones. Um, Quant Connect doesn't offer that many, but they offer the most important ones, so it's pretty decent. So with a market order, you could uh, write it like this. You could say, I want to create a market order. That's what you're doing here. 
uh, for SPY. And to be able to do it for SPY, you have to be um, signed up for the data for SPY, which we did up here, so we can do that. So for example, I wouldn't be able to write, I couldn't like put in an order for Apple right here because I am not signed up for the Apple data. Um, so I could do it for SPY. And, and then you have to put in here a number of shares that you want to buy. So let's do like, I wanna buy 100 shares of SPY. So what we're doing now is, and the market order, um, it will go be sent to your brokerage when you go live. If you go live, if you just run as a back test, it will just be filled at the immediate uh, um, uh, ask price or yeah, ask a bit price, depending on um, if you go long or short. Um, and so on your back test, it will just fill, fill instantly. Um, let's not talk about live orders yet. Um, the weakness of using market orders are that uh, is that um, you don't control what price, the maximum price you want to buy them for. So you could be filled at a horrendous price. Um, if it's a very, especially if it's a very illiquid stock, but yeah, that's a discussion for another time. Let's just stick with the bootcamp. So, and with the market order, I don't use it very often. And if you do, um, I think you should use set holdings instead, which I use down here. It's a bit easier. And with set holdings, you put in a percentage of your available portfolio um, instead of putting it a number of shares. So it's more, uh, it adjusts to how much money you have, which is um, normally better. So instead of using this market order, let's go ahead and using uh, this here. Oh, my keyboard, not on my usual keyboard, so I cannot do that. So like that. And uh, let's come out this line for now because we don't know what it means. So here we're just saying, what does this set holdings do? Well, it does pretty much what market order does instead of this one here is a percentage and one is 100%. So that means that we want to invest our entire cash, uh, all of our cash we want to invest into SPY. And then set holdings calculates how many shares that will be and, and, and put in a market order for that amount of shares. So that's super convenient. So let's say we wanted to invest 10% of our money in SPY. We could write it like this or 50% like that. Or we want to short SPY by with 10% of our money. Then we just say minus 1.5, 1 uh, 0.1. So that's super convenient. And we can also leverage. So remember that we put in leverage up here. We can put in two times and we can buy for two times our money. So we could write two here, for example, um, so that means that we have 200% of our money we want to buy SPY. So I like set holdings more and you will normally use that uh, more cases than market order. That's my experience. So um, let's see, let's talk about portfolio. Um, the, the dictionary portfolio. The algorithm portfolio is a dictionary that has a lot of helpful properties and you can look up things like, am I invested? How much money have I made? Uh, how much profit have I made? Um, how much margin have I used? All that stuff. And this is a call that you could make, self portfolio invested, which returns a Boolean that says, am I invested in anything? And if it, you are, then um, you get true. So in this case, we're saying if we are not invested, then we want to invest all of our money in the SPY. If I did not have this line of code here, then every time this on data would run, I would just put in an order for 100% of my money in SPY. 
Um, and that would work okay. But let's say that we had, um, if it wasn't the set holdings, or user percentage, then we would get up in, in trouble. Because if we just had this line of code up here, um, and not this, then we would get in trouble because then in every on data call here, every hour we would put in an order for 100 new shares of SPY. So we would quickly use our $100,000 and then start using our margin and then at the end not having enough money to buy new stocks. So that would get us in trouble. In this case we could do it uh, like this because we are setting it as a percentage. So if we don't have any more free cash, we're not gonna put in new, any new orders. So this is totally fine. But it's more clean to write it like this. Uh, so we just call it once. If we're not invested, let's put our money in SPY. Then we can use the portfolio to check different things. So let's try that. So let's say if we are not invested, invest, but then else, um, then we know we are invested. So in that case, we could um, we could debug and this debug call makes it so that you write fig different things down here in the console. Um, so that's a good way to like check up on what's going on in our algorithm. And then we could write in our debug, we could write for example, um, total, no. Yeah, we could say like total on realized profit and then we could this is just a string and then what we could do here is we could write the self the portfolio dot total on realized profit like that and the different calls you could make for portfolio, you can find in the documentation always. So if you go to algorithm, algorithm reference, and then here in secu securities and portfolios, you can see here the portfolio what you can, what information you can get, and also uh, here for a specific portfolio, a specific um, equity. So in this case. Uh, we're getting the total unrealized profit, but we could also get, for example, um, we could get the number of shares, um, number of shares, whoops, and then we could do, in that case, put it in as a dictionary. And let's do, that's the SPY we're working on. And it's the, we have to call for quantity then, like that. Okay, so I think we're good to go now. Um, let's then try and see what if we run this for just a few days. Um, and let's do it just daily so we don't get too much information. Let's see what happens. Then when, when, we, when we have uh, written this out, coded this up, we can click on backtest. And then we can delete all that. And then you can see uh, we ran this on the 4th and the 5th and uh, the more int interesting thing here is what we wrote in our console because that is what we made it right out here. So you can see on, um, I guess we didn't put in, we didn't put in the date. We could have done that as well to make it more clear. Um, but total unrealized profit is then $413. And we have a number of shares of 475. And the next day we have, we lost a good amount of, uh, we've lost some of our profits there and we still have the same amount of share, shares, which makes sense. So that seems to be working. Then let me show you how 
for example, let's say we run this from 2017 all the way up to the current date. And let's say that we have uh, a margin of uh, 2x, 2x margin. Then if we look at the SPY on the daily chart and we go back to 2017 and we measure uh, from the 1st of 17, the 3rd, we measure from that date all the way up to the current date, we can see that we would get a return of 63.6%. Not bad. But, so that is what we expect if we just keep it like this. We can double check it. Let's see, it's from 17, we invested. This all looks good. Let's uh, let's remove this so that we don't get a bunch of writing in our console. And let's just run this. And you can see we get 75.9, 78%. And that is could be partly because of the dividends that we don't take into account here. Um, that's going to increase our profits a bit. Now, let's go and see what would happen if we leverage. So let's say that we use our leverage and we say let's invest our money with two times leverage. Let's see how that works out. And now you can see we doubled our profits, which is quite nice. And the, the risky thing about leverage is that you might you can lose more money than you have, of course. But with an automated strategy, um, it decreases the risk because, for example, let's say we write it like this. Every day we would go in and readjust how many shares we have based on the 2x leverage. So if the market just dropped 10% and we run this again, if we didn't write this though, we could not put that right because else we would only do it if we're not invested. But if we did it like this, we every every day we would go in and readjust how many shares we would have based on our um, portfolio. Uh, how much uh, liquid, how much, um, how many funds we had in our uh, account, right? So actually by running this with an algorithm, even though it's a very passive strategy, we're updating it daily and therefore we minimize our chance of getting a margin call and getting li uh, liquidated by the um, by our brokers, brokers. So that is a bit confusing, I guess, but it just means that you don't have to worry so much about using leverage. Of course, you will still you lose a lot more money if the market drops but you will readjust the same the next day anyways. So then you will you will take off some of your shares and then if the market goes up, you will add a bit of your shares. So you will keep readjusting. So you will never get into like a really horrendous uh, situation. Um, I mean, this is of course not financial advice, but uh, this is a lot safer than just putting all of your money in with two times X, uh, leverage and then forgetting about it. And then there's a market crash and you, you might lose all of your money. Okay, so that was a nice little trick to um, get more out of your returns. And even an algorithm like this uh, would be a lot better than just uh, investing in a passive index like the SPY, I think, um, with some leverage in there because um, it gives you a lot greater returns. Okay, I think that's good enough for this bootcamp. Um, hope you got something out of it. All the best. Bye.